sporting women changing the game in every field. Kasta Semenya is a South African middle distance runner and the winner of two Olympic gold medals and three world championships in the women's 800 meters. She has experienced considerable success and controversy throughout her career. Desiree Ellis is the head coach of South Africa's national football team Banyana Banyana. She first made her mark as a player and captain before becoming a coach. She led Banyana Banyana to the Women's Africa Cup of Nations title and to qualify for the 2023 FIFA Women's World Cup. The moderator is Nick Said, sports writer for Forbes Africa. I'm uh, guessing that chair wasn't for me. <laughs> uh, before we get underway with our two distinguished guests, I think I'm the only male moderator here today, so I would just like to say a very special uh, happy International Women's Day to you all. When I think about the role that my mother, my wife, my daughter has played in shaping my personality, we couldn't do it without you. You, you guys are, are rocks, definitely. So, I don't think our guests need much introduction. Uh, Carsten Semenya, a double Olympic uh, 800 meters champion, uh, one of the greatest athletes that our continent has produced. Uh, coach Desiree Ellis, a four-time winner of the CAF coach, Women's Coach of the Year Prize, the only recipient, I might add. Um, both of them have given uh, an incredible legacy to African sport. Um, if I can just start with you, Carsten, you know, uh, former President Nelson Mandela famously said that sport has the power to change the world. And I think he was talking at the time, perhaps break down racial barriers, but I like to think gender barriers as well. Um, in terms of um, how things have changed in the world of athletics, how things changed for you when you came into the world of athletics, um, how was your world changed by becoming an Olympian? Oh, thank you. Good day, everyone. <laughs> uh, I would say it has changed me to be a better person. Why? Um, I had to focus more on um, humility, um, focus more on uh, treating people with respect. Uh, whilst, you know, when I grew up, you know, in the bush, I uh, was more of an um, adventurous girl. Um, I made my rules. Uh, could I could take anything how I wanted. I couldn't think about how it will affect, you know, other individual. But, you know, being involved, you know, in this, you know, sports, you know, world of sports, and then you come in and then you have to feel like you do not belong. Uh, it goes back where you, you look back where, you know, your parents have raised you. Uh, they've raised me to be a better person, but coming into learning human behavior, I think has played a vital role because I had to learn how to mute. I had, I had to learn how to, you know, distance myself from things that I cannot control. But what I can say is that the world of sports um, have told me to understand the importance of uh, human rights and treating people with respect, celebrating them, um, accepting people for their differences. Yeah. yeah. Very true. Um, Coach Des, I think when, when I first met you, you were still captain of Banyana Banyana, uh, but you were working for Touchline Media. Uh, I think before that you, you had a, a, a job in a butchery, um, if I'm not mistaken. Two very honorable uh, you know, jobs, but it would be unheard of, even at that time, for the Bafana Bafana co uh, player or captain to be having a second job outside of football. Yet that was the role that you had to play. How did you manage all of that and, and have we seen a progression from those times through to now? Um, good day everyone and happy International Women's Day to all you beautiful ladies out there. I hope you're still enjoying the day. Um, Nick, you know, I worked for Touchline Media and I think working for a company that's sports related, I think it allowed me to be able to go and play for the national team. Yes, I had to take unpaid leave, but it allowed me to go and play and make sure that I come back and have a job. I think over the years it has changed, not too much. 
you still have some girls uh, having a nine to five job and then going to training with their clubs. The only teams currently uh, that you can say are full time are the teams attached to the professional teams like Mamelodi Sundowns, TS Galaxy and Royal AM. Um, university students on the other hand, uh, obviously, you know, they study, but I know of players playing in the national team that have gone to the World Cup that have a nine to five job. So that hasn't changed. And the cry was after doing so well at the World Cup was to get a professional league going because we're going to sit here 2027 when the next World Cup comes around and we're going to speak the same story. So the message has always been to urge sponsors to come on board so that females can also, you know, have a career in South Africa. We have girls playing abroad though um, and earning a good living, but it's got to happen in the country because we are essentially an amateur team playing against professionals when we go on the international stage. Can you imagine if that young girl doesn't have a nine to five job, what more can we do? But like I said, it's changed, but for me, the wheel has turned too slowly. Yeah. And Costa, if you look at the, the now, do you feel exactly what Coach was, was saying? Do you feel that things have changed in athletics? If you, if you see the, the young girls coming through, do you feel there's more opportunity for them? Is the pathway smoother than it was perhaps for you? Uh, for me, to be, I've got to be honest, um, um, there's not a lot of changes because the infrastructure has changed. If you look into when I came in in 2009, we had um, excellent programs that are, are doing well, you know, for young upcoming, you know, athletes. But now as we speak, we focus more on winning medals instead of building, you know, these young kids to educate them, you know, to raise awareness, to make sure that they understand, you know, the importance of, you know, of sports, how to invest in themselves, how to carry themselves, you know, when they are in the world of stage. Uh, but at the moment, I'll say we try and our best, you know, to get there to make sure that we educate also our leaders uh, to see how, you know, the grassroots, you know, level, how to, you know, raise a bar and all those things. But to be honest, uh, I'm not trying to spite anyone. Um, we are trying. We are not where we want to be, but uh, I'm 100% sure, you know, in the next coming five years, uh, we'll be winning medals again. Yeah. Yeah. And Coach, there's... You, you touched on it earlier there about women's football still behind men in terms of corporate interests, finances and whatnot, and, and that's something that needs to change. And I think it is changing, but it's, it's slow progress. Um, how have you developed this Banyana team that you have into African champions, into uh, qualifying for the last two World Cups without perhaps that same support that a Bafana Bafana would have? Look, um, firstly, I surrounded myself with expertise because I'm not an expert in everything. So, you know, I could choose my own assistant coach who had a lot of knowledge or has a lot of knowledge about women's football and a good coach in her own right, Coach T. I could choose my own fitness trainer. Yes, he's male, but I'm looking at who's the best in the business. My goalkeeper coach is male. He's the best in the business. And I have an analyst and then obviously the support staff. I think that was the first step for me to surround myself with those expertise. Then after Coach Vera left, I was acting coach for two years and eventually got the job. And I believe I was God appointed because it could have happened prior to that, but it happened at the right time. And Coach Vera put a lot of things in place, so we didn't change too many things. What she didn't, wasn't able to do was to work on the final third in the attacking. And we went about trying to see how we were going to play and how we were gonna change things. But for us, it was all about teamwork. Whenever we go into a competition, it's not Desiree making the decisions, it's the staff and the players making the decision because if we speak about teamwork, everybody's gotta buy into it. So the WAFCON was a, a perfect example where we said, what, you know, what's the vision? What, what do you want to achieve? And Jermaine said, we want to win this. And I said, there's a small matter of qualifying for the World Cup. And she said, well, if we win this, we qualify for the World Cup. So we were on the same page. We said, let's bring hope to the country. You know, load shedding, unemployment, all of those things. Let's put a smile on people's faces. And, uh, you know, that's where, that's where it started to get everyone to buy in, to make sure that everybody's on the same page. And we take a day by day. And sometimes you lose a game in the beginning and if the whole country goes, ah. Oh, they're useless, oh, they haven't won. But it's a process, it's not where you start, 
it's where you end. So along the way, there's going to be a little bit of hiccups, mm -hmm. and through that, you then learn how to change things. But we're always trusting the process. We cannot choose everyone that people say we must choose. So we choose the players that we think will do the job for us. And the end result was obviously the WAFCON having done so well in 2018, coming very close. But it's a group that's tightly knit. It's a group that's connected. It's a group that cares for each other, I think, more than anything. Because when you're a team and when you're together for such a long time, and you all know with a lot of women together, there's a lot of challenges that you face. But we also, as Custis has got to respect each other. Sometimes got to stay out of each other's space. But we're there for one common goal. And that was to win the WAFCON. And through all of that, changing a little bit of things here and there, looking at the training every day, looking, did we achieve our objective? If we didn't, we'd go back and try and redo it again, working on our finishing. But everybody has that common goal. And I think that for us was key. And that's why teamwork for us is so important. All the individual awards is a bonus. Mm. Because if the team does well, the individuals will obviously stand out. So we thrive on looking out for each other, we thrive on taking care of each other, we thrive on bringing the one in that's maybe lost along the way, bringing the one closer, so that when we're a team, no matter what out happens outside, and social media is vile, you know, what happens outside, we're still there, working towards that common goal, making sure that we reach our objectives. And if you don't, like in 2020, when we didn't qualify for the Olympics, we said to ourselves, we're gonna make sure that we don't get into that position again where we get into a penalty shootout and mm. winning, the, winning the quarter final, winning the semi-finals, making sure that we got to the final, we got away from that. But you can plan things, but then it's up to the players to execute it. And the players have been absolutely magnificent in that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Costa, you've got a, Costa's got a book out, you must read it. It's, it's fantastic, The Race to Be Myself. Uh, it's, it's sort of leaving your legacy of where you've, you've been up until now. Um, what do you see as the future for you? What, where would you like to see yourself in five or, or 10 years time from now? Um, where do I see myself <laughs> in the next 10 years? <laughs> uh, look, uh, I advocate for human rights. Um, I always fight for you know, those who cannot you know, fight for themselves. Um, I want to be the voice, you know, for young African women who cannot, you know, state whatever they're feeling inside. Uh, but besides that, uh, I have a foundation where there's Maasai, you know, athletics club under it. Um, I develop, you know, young upcoming, you know, you know, athletes. I go deep in the rurals. I make sure I create opportunities for them. I have, you know, residential programs, you know, under the, you know, the foundation. Um, buzzer programs, uh, training programs. Um, I'm about, about to embark, you know, the program where I'm gonna be working more on the workshops, uh, where I can assist, you know, coaches. I install, you know, the knowledge that I have and the skills that I have. So for me, I'm about to change, you know, the game, uh, particularly in women's sports, to make sure that women are supported. We don't just talk, but we act, you know, I'm a woman of my words, and I make sure that everything that I do, um, you know, it happens. So I'll say in the next coming, you know, 10 years, uh, I want to see myself, you know, around, you know, Africa, making sure that those who are coming from disadvantaged background, they, they get the necessary, you know, uh, support that, you know, they need. Yeah. Oh, great. And... Coach Des, Coach Det has also got a book out, Magic from Salt River to the 2023 World Cup. Um, also a fascinating, fascinating read of your journey. Did, uh, Coach Des, you've also got a big assignment coming up, Nigeria uh, in the Olympic qualifiers, South Africa qualified for the Olympics in 2012 and 2016. We're looking to go back there. We're looking to you to take us there. Um, how, do you, how do you see that two-legged tie against Nigeria? Look, um, since 2018, we haven't lost to Nigeria in 90 minutes. Um, Prior to that, um, prior to that, we didn't do well. But I think the resilience that the players show, um, the competitiveness that they show, you know, I think that's been key. And I think that started in 2017. We were almost out of the Kusafa Cup and three 0 down, 75 minutes, and all of a sudden, out of nowhere, and I'm sure it's divine intervention, we, we equalized, won the penalty shootout. 
And I think that's when the belief set in. We went to the 2018 WAFCON, beat Nigeria in the first game, lost on penalties in the final. But I think the turning point for us was when we went to the Aisha Buhari Cup um, in Nigeria, and they don't really lose there. And we beat them 4-2. We then played them in the first game at the 2022 WAFCON, and we beat them there. Yes, their team has changed a bit, but I think, you know, our players have shown over the years that they've gotten better. You look at the, the players in Mexico, Hilda, Tembi, uh, Jermaine, Sinotolo, all of them thriving. But you look at the local players, and that's what's been really good for us, you know, with the Hollywood Bet Super League improving every year. So we have a plan that we have in place um, to make sure that we get past this hurdle. And this is the big one for many of us, because in 2020, as you rightfully say, you know, we didn't go to the Olympics, and that is sort of the one box that we need to tick, all of us. And I think we will put everything into, you know, qualifying for the Olympics because it creates another opportunity for players out there to be seen, for players out there to, be, to get contracts. Um, you know, many of the players nowadays have degrees, one, two, maybe three. When I was playing, 90% were unemployed, so that shows how things have changed. And from there, they go abroad and get contracts. But this is the biggest game of our lives, um, the two games we play. Um, we play away first, and we're hoping to get a result there and to come home. And we're hoping the fans come out in their numbers again like they did in Bombela, um, because we play for them. You know, our president always says that, you know, when we go to a stadium, we are entertainers. When we go to a stadium, as someone coming from home, um, maybe having challenges, maybe having issues, and for that 90 minutes, we must make them smile. And that's what we're going to try and do. Well, thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time. It's been a fascinating chat. I've got 20 more questions I'd love to ask. But thank you so much to Castor. Thank you so much to Coach Des. Um, and yeah, best of luck to the future for both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.